Support for LAist comes from Japan House Los Angeles, presenting the free exhibition Pokemon Meets Koge. Experience the world of Pokemon through the ingenuity of Japanese artists working in traditional and contemporary crafts. More info at japanhousela.com. Support for LAist comes from the Soraya at Cal State Northridge, presenting Herb Alpert on January 27th in the Jazz at Naz Festival. Alpert and wife Lonnie Hall celebrate 50 years of marriage, playing hits from old albums and new. Info at thesoraya.org. LAist Studios. Hey, y'all. It's the end of the year, so today we're going to rerun a few of my favorite episodes from 2023. Enjoy and Happy New Year. Feliz Año. Oh my God, this looks official. This looks official. What is this? <sighs> Remember a couple of weeks ago when I told you I was getting ready to go on a trip to Mexico? Authorization for parole of an alien into the United States, Department of Homeland Security. If you haven't heard that episode yet, to recap, I was approved for something called advanced parole. It's a travel document that allows some DACA recipients like me to travel abroad without applying for a visa. Parole purpose is DACA. Authorization is valid for one entry. DACA has been life-changing for hundreds of thousands of young people. Deportation relief, access to driver's license, work authorization. But DACA doesn't provide a pathway to legalization. Beneficiaries can still be deported, removed from this country. That means for hundreds of thousands of people like me, even the country is not simple. What advanced parole provides is the opportunity to re-enter the United States right after leaving the country. Traveling outside the authorization period may result in termination of DACA. And not only that, I had to plan out this entire trip in like two weeks. return on or before March 14th? I gotta get going now. Not to mention, leaving the United States even with your advanced parole document does not guarantee that you will be paroled into the United States. I know this is official, but damn. Well, spoiler alert, I did go on that trip. Hola, hola. Como estas, hijo? And I did come back. But I am. <laughs> but it was conflicting. I was getting a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to hug my abuelita in person. But it also reminded me how fragile my immigration status is, how much work it takes for DACA recipients to even go see a sick loved one. And it showed me how much I still don't understand about the U.S. immigration system. People who grow up in this country grow up to believe that we have certain freedoms to seek permission to leave the country, to see a dying loved one. It leaves many people flat-footed. I'm Brian De Los Santos, and this is a special three-part series from Elias Studios and How to LA, Finding Home con DACA. Oh my God, I'm going to Mexico, y'all. Part one, the process. DACA will turn 11 years old this summer. I would argue that it's been the most successful immigrant integration policy we've seen in decades. That's Roberto Gonzalez. And I teach sociology at the University of Pennsylvania. And he's also testified before Congress on immigration policy reform. The situation has not changed dramatically in those 11 years. And Congress has had more than a decade to act, and it has not. Those who have DACA are no closer to citizenship, no closer to a broader set of rights than they were when they first obtained DACA. I consider myself someone who's very well informed as a journalist, obviously, but I have been since I was told I was undocumented in middle school. I had to kind of be in the survival mode of like, I have to be a one step ahead with information, whether it was resources or even how to drive in certain streets. The LAPD versus the LA County Sheriff's, you know, who was more pro-immigrant or who was more anti-immigrant in those departments. Since I found out I was undocumented, it's always been like a risk of just living here. And DACA has made things a lot easier, obviously. I'm able to work legally, I have a driver's license, travel outside the country with advanced parole, but 
you know, I can't vote. And then you do this permit every two years. It gets tiring to just go through this. And I'm curious to know what have you heard through your work, through your research, through talking to communities. Because like you said earlier, there isn't any progress or change with the DACA program so far. Yeah, this is a really difficult thing. My involvement with undocumented young people dates back to the early 1990s. I was really curious about, you know, what do young people do who've grown up in this country and don't have status? What do they look like over time? I started realizing that many of the young people that I spoke to were describing physical and emotional manifestations of stress. Chronic headaches, toothaches, ulcers, trouble getting out of bed in the morning, sleep disorders, eating disorders, thoughts of suicide. The stress of seeing friends that you've grown up with who are able to advance in their lives while you stay in one place. Having to keep secrets from people you're very close to about your status. Constant looking over your shoulder always, always on the alert in case something would happen. There's this kind of saying is I, I feel like I'm neither from here nor there. The advanced parole has been a game changer for so many young people to touch ground in their countries of birth. But the advanced parole windows can be very tight. A person may wait months or even a full year for USCIS to process their request, then once they are approved, they may have just weeks to complete that trip. February 6th, 2023. The moment I got that letter in the mail, I could see a stopwatch just hanging over my head. I sent my original request five months ago and heard nothing back. Now it's real. I gotta figure everything out, fast. First thing that pops into my head is my apartment search is kind of put on hold. Next thing is like, how do I even get there? And it's super expensive. Like I gotta leave in about two weeks. So I know that prices are not gonna be pretty. What are the gay friendly spots? I don't even have a damn suitcase. Shoes, clothes, my gear for work. Are they gonna give me the time off? Who's gonna host a podcast? I gotta talk to my manager. Actually, that I'm leaving the country. Wait, where am I even gonna stay? Hello. Hey, Dad, it's me. Oh, what's up, Igor? Um, okay, so have some news. Good news or bad news? <laughs> it is. It's good news. It's it's good news. Um, I'm going to Mexico. <laughs> oh, wow. That's <laughs> um, wonderful. That's great. When do you know that? I just found out through this letter that I got sent to at home. Essentially, only have like two weeks and a few days to prepare. Mm -hmm. And... I am trying not to freak out about it and have an anxiety attack, but um, tengo una amiga que sabe de inmigración y ella me dice, si estás estresado. So I tell my dad and I'm like, my friend who knows about immigration stuff told me that if I'm anxious or stressed out about crossing the border legally this time, I should just bring someone with me. They could be helpful if anything goes wrong. So, mi pregunta para ti es, ¿pudieras llegar conmigo de regreso a los Estados Unidos? Can you come back into the U.S. with me? Well, well, well. Well, um, we are planning to, to go with your mom over there, and probably we can meet over there. You go together, you, you can see your grandma from my side, your grandma from your mother's side. Everything will be there over there. Oh, wait, wait when are you going? Uh, Do you know the date? I need to check my calendar, but if you need me to come back with you at an earlier time, I can move my flight and fly with you. No problem, Nico. I'm going to be honest here. It's hard to overestimate how stressful it was to plan out this trip. And my experience was probably easier compared to many other undocumented people. I'm a journalist who has reported on immigration before, and I have a lot of contacts in that space. I had a great immigration lawyer. I had family to stay with in Mexico. I have a job that was willing to let me leave on short notice. The process was still complicated. 
Every step of the way, it felt like I was being kicked back into survival mode. And I kept asking myself, why does it have to be this way? Like, why is this so difficult? Most Americans agree that, that our immigration system has broken, been broken for a long time. But it's also a really hot button topic. And our Congress has been gridlocked for the last decade or so. So in the absence of congressional action, immigration lawmaking has been done through the executive branch. DACA, temporary protected status, the Remain in Mexico program, Muslim ban. The lawmaking has been really done through administrative actions. And immigration law is very complicated. It's really complicated. It's complex. And anyone who's listening to this conversation should consult with a lawyer. I mean, it's it's not as clear cut for every case that you put through the, you know, USCIS or such. But there are some very specific benefits to re-entering the country via advanced parole, right? Yeah. So depending on how you enter, it really shapes the avenues available for adjusting your status. With an advanced parole document, that counts as a lawful entry to the United States, which then is a requirement then for qualified individuals to be able to apply for a green card. Um, I want to turn to something that's a little bit more joyous, a little bit more light. Um, I don't know when I'm going to be able to go back to Mexico or take another trip like this outside of the country in the near future. Hello, Dad. At this point, I'm just as excited as I am nervous. So I asked my dad for advice. He's been around the world and has been back to Mexico many times. Yeah, no, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. I do want to visit Mexico City, and I obviously want to go back to Veracruz. Anything that we do, I want to eat good. So I want some some home cooking, the Veracruz. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. You both grandmas, they cook really good. Mole, enchiladas, red rice, really delicious. Fried beans, tamales, salada, garnachas, memelas, everything, everything is there. What's the one thing I have to try when I'm in Veracruz then? Definitely go to, um, it's called Los Portales. Es un lugar icónico, es un lugar especial ahí en Veracruz. Todo el mundo lo conoce, todo el mundo quiere ir. Todo el que es turista llega ahí y pide un lechero, un lecherito. Es un café autóctono que te lo sirven y hay una manera especial de servir. Cuando vea, llegues ahí te vas a sorprender. Y la otra cosa, una concha con natas. Mm. Eso es, diríamos, es lo, lo clásico. A cualquier hora del día te lo sirven y está bien delicioso. Oh, that sounds yummy. I mean, I remember you telling me about las conchas con nata, but I don't, obviously never had one like that. I don't, did you ever try to recreate it for us at home? I don't even remember that. No, la <laughs> leche de aquí, the milk from here, it doesn't create the nata. Then it has to be real cow milk. Mm. All right. That makes me a little bit more happier than being stressed out right now and being freaked out by the news, obviously, because I, I wasn't expecting this letter, right? I think I told you I applied, like, a while ago, and I'm just hearing now about it. Yeah, yeah. But uh, don't worry about it. When you get to Veracruz, there is a lot of places where you can stay. You don't need to stay in a hotel. You can stay with my mom, or you can stay with your grandmother from your mom's side. Then your aunt can take you out. Your, one of your uncles can take you out in Orizaba, or Veracruz, Harbor. They can take you to your hometown. Enjoy it over there. Veracruz is very beautiful. The beach is very beautiful. The food is over there really nice. There is a lot of places around to visit. Oh, thanks, Dad. But you you planning to go to Mexico City alone? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh man, they will notice you that you are not from there. Why? Because of my bad Spanish. And because you're bad Spanish, because <laughs> the way you dress, the way you talk. I mean, in, in Mexico City, especially from the airport in that area, they have an intonation in their talking, and they know when somebody is from that that region. I'd be worried about it. I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm an adult. I'm 32 years old. I'll be in Ubers and stuff. I'm going to be walking alone. <laughs> As I think about being in Mexico, I also reflect about who I am here in the United States. The experiences I've been through and the ones I missed out by not being able to visit Mexico. And it's not just me. Others have felt a disconnect too. Many years ago, I met a, a young man in California who was from Mexico, 
I think that he had migrated at age one. And he was so proud of his country, of his heritage. He's a fan of the Chivas soccer team. <laughs> but he really lamented that he didn't know his country. I've met many, many young people who've taken trips. And just the, the raw emotion that they described, sitting around a kitchen table with relatives, being able to embrace somebody. So many young people that I met also um, missed many birthdays, funerals of grandparents. And so the ability to, to go back in person there's no underscoring enough, just the, the, the power of those kinds of moments that until recently have just been closed off to them. And those stories are multiplying as these young people are kind of finding each other and gaining courage to talk about their situation. February 24th, 2023. I got my Mexican passport, I have my California driver's license, I have my DACA work permit with me, just in case. And last but not least, my boarding pass to Mexico for the first time ever. Do you know which airline are you taking off? It is... Okay, Terminal 6. We're going to Terminal 6. On the way to the airport, all these stressful thoughts kept coming back into my head. So I have enough cash to change. Is my Spanish going to sound okay? Or am I going to sound like a pocho? It's raining in LA right now. So are we going to be delayed? Is my plane going to change? Like, I'm kind of freaking out. But then on the other side of me, I'm also thinking, I get to go to Mexico. I finally get to kind of like experience life there. I'm going to get to eat tacos and drink mezcal and go to the beach, I think, and learn about my history. But I'm still freaking out. It's okay. It's okay, Papa. It's going to be a great experience. I'm very happy for you. And um, I'm really grateful because that's a thing that you've been waiting for a long time. And that's great. That's great. Thanks, Dad. You're welcome. Congratulations. Next time on Finding Home, Gondaka. It smells like Mexico. It smells like... My mom. I stepped foot in Mexico for the first time in 30 years. Hola, hola. ¿Cómo estás, hijo? That's after the break, in part two. Hecho en Mexico. I'm Ruby Ferguson. I'm 27. I received my approval letter February of 2022. I had not been to Mexico since I was seven years old, I wanted to see my family. I wanted to see my grandparents. I can still remember every detail of the trip. My name is Luis Ramirez. I am 35 years old. I remember feeling like it wasn't real that I had left the country. I had arrived at the airport in Guanajuato and was getting picked up by my mom and my cousin and to drive over to the little town that I grew up in still felt very surreal. When the plane was landing into Veracruz, I saw the ocean. I saw the houses. They were so vibrant, the colors. That feeling of knowing that I had finally made it to my home country after all this time. My grandmother and my aunt standing there, being able to hug them after two decades. There's just this magic to being surrounded by family that just pour all this love. I hope that in the future I'm able to travel again, to see my family again. We're going to be right back after this break.
Support for LAist comes from Japan House Los Angeles, presenting Pokemon meets Koge. This free exhibition showcases over 70 works by 20 celebrated Japanese craft artists. Playful images of Pikachu, dyed onto silk cloth, a Charizard integrated into a ceramic jar, a dazzling Jolteon built up with lightning bolts made of hammered copper, plated with gold and silver, and more. Experience the world of Pokemon through the ingenuity of Japanese artists working in traditional and contemporary crafts. More info at japanhousela.com. Support for Elias comes from the Soraya at Cal State Northridge, presenting the world premiere of Diavolos Existencia with music, dance, architecture, and recordings from those who lived through the 1994 Northridge earthquake. Diavolo and the Soraya are joining forces to commemorate the quake 30 years ago, showing how a community changes in the face of disaster with resilience and humility. January 17th and 19th. Information at thesoraya.org. February 24th, 2023. So I just got to Puerto Vallarta and it is really pretty and warm. From Elias Studios and How to LA, this is Finding Home con DACA. I'm Brian De Los Santos. It is surreal to be here because it smells like Mexico. It smells like what I've grew up my mom grandma smelling i'm in puerto vallarta jalisco it's my first stop in mexico because i wanted to have some fun before i explore mexico itself as i'm taking the sights smells and sounds of mexico for the first time in my adult life my heart is literally racing i am in this little corridor behind all the busy streets. It's like gardens, playgrounds, skate park. There's like a little stage type thing. That's exactly what I wanted to do when I came here. All right, which way is the beach? I've never felt truly Mexican, but I'm also not American. At least not in the way that many people think. I've always felt like I'm somewhere in between a person always looking for their true home. We have a phrase for this in Spanish, ni de aquí ni de allá. And now I'm getting this chance to see my roots in person. It's the people, it's, I don't know, speaking Spanish. It's knowing that this is your country. I was approved for something called advanced parole. It's a travel document that allows some DACA recipients like me to travel outside the country and return without a visa. I'm leaving the country. I'm first time leaving my country. Hey. Oh my <laughs> this whole thing is not an easy process. And people who do get approved typically only have a few weeks to get their travel plans together and go. Hola, Hola, ¿cómo and the stakes are pretty high. Trying to return to the U.S. after your deadline could mean losing DACA, a.k.a. my driver's license, my work permit, my social security card. I met a group of other queer Mexicans, and the first thing they said, girl, you may be living in L.A., but you the same like us. <laughs> but for me and so many other DACA recipients, the chance to visit our countries of birth, learning about our history, and hugging our abuelitas in person is worth the risk. I was at the beach earlier with a friend I met here in Mexico. In Puerto Vallarta, there was a moment where the sun was just setting and it was just so beautiful. I said, this is the happiest I've ever been in my life. The beach, the sun, no worries, no thoughts. And I don't think I've ever experienced that. I try to be this journalist right now. <laughs> Recording, what are you feeling and why are you crying? <laughs> After 30 years of living in the United States, I'm finally stepping foot in Mexico, and this could be my only chance to do it. It's like I'd had to fight my way to find this happiness. So I'm happy, I'm upset, I'm all the emotions right now because because I can't have this all the time. 
And it took so much to get here. So much. It's not fair. Part two, Hecho en México. February 28, 2023. I just arrived in Ciudad, Mexico after four days in Puerto Vallarta. There was fun, the beach, drinks, meeting new friends, connecting with communities there. But now in Ciudad, Mexico, I'm looking forward to seeing the historical monuments, the city-like environment, and also connecting the dots between LA and Mexico City. There's so many parks, like literally around every corner, yeah, yeah. and it's so pretty because it's so well kept. I hear that Mexico City is kind of like LA without the gringos. My friend Javi and I get in his car and we're playing tourists, obviously. And we're going to Coyacan, which is a really beautiful historic town in Mexico City. And I had to ask him how he viewed me. Am I Mexican? What do you see me as? You are not gringo. No te sientes gringo. No, porque no tengo como las el privilegio. And I no tell him, el, no, estado, I'm not gringo. Social. I am not a Chicano. I don't claim those things because I'm undocumented. You know, I don't have a U.S. citizenship. I don't have a green card. Ah, yeah, porque sí, te, no tengo papeles. No eres gringo con todos los derechos. Exactamente. Pero de culturalmente aquí pareces más gringo. After we talk a little bit, I think I get it. When I was younger, I would look at the things I didn't have, what I couldn't do in the U.S., and he tells me, well, I can do these things. He made me realize about all these privileges that I do have in the U.S., having a work permit, having a car, being able to navigate life a little easier, the opportunities I've been able to take just by living here in L.A. <laughs> but I told Javi, I don't feel like the people here treat me differently because of it. I no, no, no. Aquí siempre, los mexicanos siempre te... Aquí en México te vamos a tratar como de pásale paisano, ya sabes. You're a Mexican when you're here in Mexico, he says. We'll treat you like our own. One of the things I did in Mexico City was to visit Parque Mexico. I am in Parque Mexico to celebrate the life of my friend, Armando Montaño, probably one of the best friends I've ever had in my life. He was just amazing and smart, so talented. And he was a journalist. Mondo came to Mexico City for the Associated Press. This was his first kind of solo experience. And I wasn't out as a gay person. He was. He'd been out for a while, actually. <laughs> The reason I say that is because he would write to me all of his fun adventures, meeting new friends, going to dinners, dancing to his favorite songs. And I remember one day he was getting ready to go out with his friends in this area. And I told him, oh, my God, have fun. Tell me everything would happen in the morning. I want to know. He said something to the effect of like, of course, cutie, we'll talk later. Um... That was the last time I've ever talked to Mondo. I think at that point in my life, I was really young and I didn't really know what loss meant. I feel a little sad right now. <laughs> and I feel the same grief I've felt over the years. This park was one of his favorite spots in the city. It feels like I am with him. <laughs> um, I actually bought a orange daisy and I brought it to the park with me because I want to place it in a place that to me is Mondo and I'll find a spot in the park and I'm gonna just think about him and tell him how much I miss him and how much I love him and that he became an inspiration for me to this day because y'all, if Mondo were alive at this moment, he'd be running shit. Like, you have no idea. A couple days later, I went to the Museo of Antropologia in Ciudad Mexico. 
But it wasn't the exhibit that struck me the hardest. It was this family. The daughter and an elderly woman, her husband or her partner, they were all together just hanging out in the museum and they were looking at this exhibition, talking about how the exhibition that was indigenous culture reflected them. And I'm like, this is what it feels like to be represented in history. And for me, this is what I've never felt being in museums. And yes, there's been beautiful exhibitions in museums in Los Angeles and across the U.S., but it finally clicked of where I came from, the way that it was governed and the way that there were empires and colonization came and then the great Mexican-American War and all this historical perspective to me was just, it finally clicked for me. I had an aha moment of learning about myself. March 6th, 2023. One week in Ciudad Mexico really wasn't enough. I wanted to spend more time eating, obviously, meeting more people, connecting, going to museums. I only went to about three or four places that were historical. I wanted to do more. But I am on a schedule, so I really had to get going to Veracruz. It's kind of wild because I get to see the physical location of my identity. It's manifested here in Ciudad Mendoza, Veracruz. But I've always struggled where I fit into this place. Like, my parents tell me stories about what it is to live here, but I've never lived here. I've struggled with that term again my whole entire life. Ni de aquí, ni de allá. Not from here, not from there. And now that I'm here, it's kind of like an out-of-body experience. I'm walking around with my tia and my prima, and they're showing me around Ciudad Mendoza, which is our hometown. Oh, wow. We just came from Tacos, and we're walking at night. It felt like I was getting the full Ciudad Mendoza experience, hanging out with family, just casually, Talking about work, talking about the culture here in Mexico, and also talking about family chisme. Uh-huh. This was a moment that I had never had before. I'm not able to do this in LA. I couldn't have done it anywhere else, and just by being here and doing some really simple things like eating tacos meant the world for me. As we walk up to my grandma's door, my dad's telling me all this family history and drama about like the family home and the neighbor next door. And why, why did they fight the property? Because it's coming to seven. There, no. No. there was this feud about like location and territory and real estate stuff. And I'm over here like nervous as heck, just trying to meet my grandma. Mommy! Hola. Hola, abuela. ¿Cómo estás, hijo? Bien. ¿Sabes quién es? Brian. Me acordar. Ahí está en las fotos. Todos los días veo y lo veo. I truly thought that I would never get to meet my paternal grandma in person ever again. It, like, my heart was racing. I felt like I was getting dizzy. Y te veo todos los días, todos días pido por ti. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sí, mijo. Había un pollito que te lo mandé con tu hermano. ¿No te lo dio? My whole life I've waited for this moment, and I know it sounds a little cheesy, but it truly felt like I'd been waiting for this moment my whole life. She's so small and tiny. Her hair is way prettier in person. You know, she has some sort of like style to her. It was just this moment of like the most simple hello, but it meant the world to me. I stayed with my grandma on my mom's side for about five nights. <laughs> There's this train called La Bestia that runs from the south end of Mexico all the way to the north. And that train passes through my grandma's house at any hour at night. Back when I was eight years old, 10 years old, 15 years old, 25 years old, when I would Skype with my grandma or I would talk on the phone with her, Every so often you'd hear the blare of the horn and it was so palpable just hearing that train on the phone. 
made me think of Ciudad Mendoza, Veracruz as a part of home. And now I'm here in the same house where I heard that train sound. And it's keeping me up at night. March 11, 2023. I'm sitting in the kitchen at my grandma's house and the spread looks delicious. Across from me, it is my grandma and my dad and our family friend, Selena. There is fruit, a fruit bowl in the middle of the table. We have coffee and we have eggs a la mexicana. And we're just talking about our trip back home because I know in just a few hours, I'm going to be getting on a plane and departing from Veracruz to Tijuana and off to San Diego in L.A. This whole trip had an expiration date. At almost every step of the way, when it's been a joyous occasion or it's been a moment that I just want to keep, I do feel like a little bit of grief comes along with that. It feels like you're celebrating and then you're kind of putting it in a little box and putting it away because you don't know when you can tap into that emotion again. Going to church service with my uncle, going to a gay bar with my friends, eating tamales or tacos or having a mezcal from Mexico. But there is always an expiration date. And for me, that's the hard part. I don't know when I'll be back. I don't know when I'll have this opportunity to apply for advanced parole again. So it feels like you're celebrating and then you're kind of putting it in a little box and putting it away because you don't know when you can tap into that emotion again. And you have to set your expectations. I think that was the hard pill to swallow. Next time on Finding Home con DACA, I made it into the U.S. We're in San Diego. I'm about to drive to L.A. after 17 days in Mexico. I'm back in the U.S. and all I'm thinking about is... I miss it and I want to go back. And we're talking about the emotional journey so many immigrants and their families have navigated by finding home in Los Angeles and the United States. I would cry and tell my mom, like, let's go back. Like, please, let's go back. That's in part three, Outside In. My name is Maria. I am the creator of the Instagram page at Itiene Papeles. I applied to Advanced Parole for humanitarian purposes. I'm Beatrice Casares Herman. I'm 36 years old. I hadn't been back to Mexico since I left at the age of three, and I wanted to see a granduncle whose health was quickly deteriorating. The most vivid memory of my time there was realizing that it was the middle of my stay. I remember going up to the room that I was sharing with my abuelita, and she was asleep, and I started hugging her, and It just kind of hit me that time was running out and I don't know how long until I would return or if I would ever see her again. Upon my return back to LA, I was a mess. I had a panic attack as the plane boarded in Mexico, even though I knew I had a legal document that allowed me to return. As I handed my documents to the officer, the first words out of his mouth were, welcome home. Stay with us as we feature part three after this break. Support for LAist comes from Japan House Los Angeles, presenting Pokemon Meets Koge. This free exhibition showcases over 70 works by 20 celebrated Japanese craft artists. Playful images of Pikachu dyed onto silk cloth, a Charizard integrated into a ceramic jar, a dazzling Jolteon built up with lightning bolts made of hammered copper, plated with gold and silver, and more. Experience the world of Pokemon through the ingenuity of Japanese artists working in traditional and contemporary crafts. More info at japanhousela.com. 
Support for this LAist podcast comes from the Soraya at Cal State Northridge and the Jazz at Naz Festival. Legendary trumpeter and Tijuana Brass founder Herb Alpert and his wife, two-time Grammy winner Lonnie Hall, celebrate their golden anniversary, 50 years married, performing greatest hits from their solo careers, their latest work, and more on January 27th. Learn more at thesoraya.org. Hola, abuela. ¿Cómo estás, hijo? From Elias Studios and How to LA, this is Finding Home con DACA. I am in this little corridor behind all the busy streets. It's like gardens, playgrounds. There's like a little stage type thing. This is exactly what I wanted to do when I came here. Even with DACA, which lets me legally work and drive, I've always felt like there's this big question mark over my immigration status. Am I American? Am I Mexican? Am I stuck in the middle? And here's the real tea. My story is really not unique. Okay. There are hundreds of thousands of undocumented folks right here in LA who have struggled to find their sense of home. And I feel like this trip to Mexico has really given me a new perspective, a new sense of what that word home means to me. It's the people, it's, I don't know, speaking Spanish, it's knowing that this is your country. Part three, outside in. March 11, 2023. Four days ago, when I had just got into Veracruz, I remember I was changing clothes because it was hot. My grandma walked by and she saw the necklace I was wearing, which is a really like thin necklace. And she's like, oh, it's such a small necklace. ¿Por qué tienes esa? Es Why do you have that small necklace? I told her, well, my dad gave it to me. You know, I was like kind of like shading her because like, I didn't understand why she was being weird. She's like, oh, I'm going to give you a really nice gold necklace one day. And then flash forward to today, it's Friday. And I'm just about to leave to go back to Los Angeles. I literally have everything packed in my suitcase and I'm about to leave. Uh -huh. I think my uh -huh. grandma says is that and she's like, oh, come here. Side note, my grandma is a funny, weird woman. She's like a lot of abuelitas. She has a lot of comments to say. She tells me to go into her room, opens this box, and it's a really nice gold necklace, really thick and long. Wow. She tells me, I wanted to give you this because I don't know when you'll return, and I don't know if I'll be alive, so I want to give this to you today. And again, her being abuelita, she's like, don't wear it out with your yeah. friends. Wear it only for special <laughs> occasions. You know, as you were saying that, I was looking at my wrist because I actually I'm wearing a bracelet that my grandma sent me from Mexico. Oh, wow. Someone. This is Chris Farias, my chisme amigo and our social media producer for Eliest. And he's also a DACA beneficiary. I think I was going to graduate like eighth grade, I believe. She sent me a really nice dress shirt with a tie mm. and she sent me this bracelet half of me like i'm scared to wear it all the time because if i lose it that's the last thing i have you know but then if i don't wear it like i feel like she's not with me you better know that like anytime that i want to look good that necklace is mm. coming with me <laughs> yeah. i i think it's just yeah. so special because for them you know they live in Mexico, they don't make the same yeah. amount of, you know, money that they could have made here in the U.S. Their opportunities are different. And she gave me a piece of hers that is yeah. valuable to her. So I oh. definitely going to be wearing it. So next time that we hang out, I'll bring it with me. Yes, yes, <laughs> please, please. We'll have to take a photo with your bracelet and then with my necklace. We'll put it on Instagram be like, yeah. you know, DACA. Stack of friends over here. If you know, you know. <laughs> if you know, you know. Later that day, I finally landed in Tijuana with my dad and our family friend Selena. 
As soon as the plane landed, I could feel my nervous system go into like survival mode. I remember walking out of the airplane with all my bags, gripping on my backpack really tight and gripping on my phone even harder, texting my friends like, hey, FYI, I made it to Tijuana. I'm going to go through immigration soon-ish. I did not know what to expect. There's this official from the Mexican side. They're like, where's your visa? And I'm like, I don't have one. I have DACA. This official looked kind of puzzled. And I'm like, are they not going to let me in? Everything just like hit me like a train. She flagged someone else and I'm waiting maybe like a minute. But that minute felt like three hours. But... As soon as the other official came through, he's like, oh, yeah, he's a DACA recipient. Uh, Just ask for his advanced parole document. And she checked it and she's like, "Okay, go ahead. I kept walking. I was going through this like long hallway that eventually leads you to the U.S. immigration side. There was no line whatsoever. It was an empty airport. We get to the front of the immigration official. She asked for our passports. I give her my DACA permit, my advanced parole documentation. I even like have my social security card to show that like, you know, I I do live and work in the US and I have my driver's license. But this person was really nice and friendly and she was just like, okay, you can wait for him in the lobby. He's gonna go to a room with me. He's only gonna take like 10 minutes. There, you know, I had to present my my documentation. I presented to the other officer. At a certain point, the officer kind of starts joking with me because I told him, like, oh, I speak English too, you know? And he's like, oh, you're just pulling my leg now, making me work harder. And that's when I knew, like, it, I was going to make it to the other side. I was going to go through this immigration process quite easily. He gave me back my documentation within, like, 15 minutes or so. And I walked back, and the first sign I see... Welcome to the United States of America. And that was a moment where I felt like, wow, this is how it feels to re-enter this country, my country. And I do want to say that not everyone goes through this process this smoothly and without panic. But for me, it honestly felt like a big relief. I made it into the US, we're in San Diego. I am about to drive to LA after 17 days in Mexico. This trip meant so much for me. Just being in that airport and feeling like I made it back to San Diego, back to California, made me feel like, oh, yeah, I'm kind of part of the fabric of this country. If someone were to ask me, are you Mexican or American after this trip, I will definitely say a different answer. What I would say, I was born in Mexico. I love Mexico. I love my hometown. But I do identify with being American more. It is more of the culture that I have. It is more of the way that I speak, even the way I dress, as my dad says. So I definitely will say I'm an Angelino who lives in L.A., but has Mexican roots. When I talk about home now, it's about who I am. And I think visiting Veracruz, visiting Ciudad Mexico, visiting Puerto Vallarta, that has fed into who I am as a person and really the role I play here in journalism or here in the United States or Los Angeles. As I've been sharing my story, I've been asking folks to share their experiences. I heard from folks who have done advanced parole like me, but I also heard stories about people who self-deported and people who chose to leave the U.S. for their birth country. I really wanted to know, for all kinds of immigrants, what does it take to find home? I can't claim being American, but I can't claim being a full Mexican or half and half. I can't. L.A. becoming my home took a very long time. That's Chris again. I have this vivid image of the last hug I gave my family. I'm kind of glad that I was only five and I didn't fully understand that that was probably the last time I was going to see them. But I remember and I can hear the cries of all of my bolitos and abuelitas and tias, tios, cousins. They were all outside a big bus waving out to my mom, my brother and I. And they were just hysterically crying. And I didn't understand why. All I knew was I'm going to go see my dad. 
in Mexico, I could say I had everything. I had my family, we had a home, you know, I had a happiness coming into this country. My dad, like he lived in a garage when we got here and he didn't have a stable job. He was an alcoholic. I would cry and tell my mom, like, let's go back. Like, please, let's go back. When LA then became my home, it was when I was a lot older, maybe like 10 years later, when I understood the language more. When my dad finally stopped drinking, when my little brothers weren't that little anymore and they could be independent, meaning that I didn't have to take care of them all the time. I know that if I go back, it is very different now. You know, half of the family that I had there, they're no longer there, either because they passed or, you know, they moved away. My primos, they're not children anymore either. They're in their 20s and their 30s, they have kids. Now, as an adult and understanding the sort of like privilege I do have in terms of me comparing myself to my family in Mexico, like we can afford more things and we do make more money. We do have a lot more resources like education, luckily. I understand all that now and, and it's, it's my home. It, it really, it, it's become my home, but it took a very long time. Hola, hola, my name is Crisol Serrano. I am from Sonora, Mexico. I have been in the States for 30 years. But the question is, when did the States start feeling like home? When did I realize this is home? If I'm being honest, I feel part of me is still in search of that feeling. I'm still figuring it out. I think of little me on her first day of kindergarten. And you know how they say it's wild how our parents just dropped us off at school fresh here in the States without knowing the language. They're just like, here, have a great day. <laughs> so I think of that day and the realization of how different everything was. The language, the food, everything. So I think that's the day I realized this is not a long staycation. This is going to be home. And I'm going to have to adapt and learn I also think of Sundays, you know those Sunday mornings in LA, cuando you have like the wind a little crack and the fresh air is coming in, breakfast is being made, you and your siblings and your parents get together at the same table. It's that one day a week where you actually sit together and enjoy meal together. And I think it just felt like we were back in Mexico. My name is Ari Ruiz and I was born in Mexico City. My mom brought me and my brother to live in Los Angeles in 2001, but we didn't really feel a sense of belonging until we were actually, ironically, in Mexico City because we had to self-deport in order for us to get a waiver asking for forgiveness for having crossed to the U.S. illegally. For six months while we were waiting for that permission to come back to the U.S., I would check every week our mail. I was waiting for our, my passport. I was waiting for my visa. I wanted to come back so bad. And when we finally got it, I felt like I'm finally going to belong in this country. I'm finally going to reach the American dream, get my Greek card. Now it's so surreal. You know, three years ago in 2019, I became a U.S. citizen. It's one of those moments where you're like, I'm dreaming, you know, like I had to pinch myself, like, oh my God, I am an American now. I'm a citizen, I can vote, I can do so much more stuff. That's something that grounds me in the work that I do every single day, working for Congress One Mexican Waters, knowing that I know what it feels to be not seen. And if I can't see the people that I work for, I can't serve them. And I know that we still have 11 plus million undocumented people here who are in desperate need of immigration reform and so I know that the job is not finished. A huge thank you to everyone who shared their stories with us throughout this series. This has been Finding Home Gondaka, a special three-part series from How to LA and Elias Studios. 
And if you want to hear more about my journey, I've got a big old emotional write-up over on Elias.com slash how to LA. This last song I want to play you is something I had on repeat my whole damn trip. In mi tierra veracruzana, solo quiero tomar café. Un poquito de azúcar y caña, pa ponerme a mover los pies. De la penca de una banana, de su verde morena piel. Ando toda reenamorada, solo quiero volverte a ver, volverte a ver. Thanks for tanging along and sending your support. This was a hard and very different story to tell. A very personal one. So it really means a lot. A big shout out to our producer Evan Jacoby, who spent a lot of time and love into this series. Our other producers are Megan Botel and Victoria Alejandro. Thanks to Hasmik Pagosian, our engineer. Chris Farias is our social media producer. Erica Washington writes our newsletter. Megan Larson is our executive producer. And I'm your host, Brian De Los Santos. That's it for today. I'll talk to you mañana. Support for this podcast is made possible by Gordon and Donna Crawford, who believe that quality journalism makes Los Angeles a better place to live. Imagine if you could charge your electric vehicle at the places you already love to eat, shop, and play. Whether you're at the movies, on your weekly grocery trip, or running errands at your local mall, Volta EV charging stations are built around your day-to-day and located in your community and nationwide. All you have to do is check in, plug in, and go about your day. It's EV charging made convenient. Download the Volta app to find your new favorite place to charge.